Nicholas James Masucci was a 60-year-old from Kearney, New Jersey. He was a businessman and sharp dresser. On September 18, 1974, he had lunch with his daughter, then said he was driving to Brooklyn for business, but didn't say who he was meeting. A couple days later, his car was found in Manhattan. He was never seen again. I'm Ed Denzel, and this is Unfound. There's a saying that if you travel far enough, you'll meet yourself. And in fact, genetically and in terms of evolution, scientists believe, and given that there are over 7 billion people on the Earth, that there is somebody who looks exactly like us on this planet. Our doppelganger. Or are we those people's doppelgangers? It's hard to say. Given that, I guess it could be literally true that if we travel far enough, we could meet someone who is us at least as far as looks are concerned. Well, for the last year and a half since starting Unfound, I knew eventually that if I covered enough cases, figuratively traveling all over the United States, that I would meet myself, that there would be a case that I was connected to in some way. And in fact, if I had been a reporter, I might have had to recuse myself, given my closeness to the case at the time. Well, today is that day. This is the case where I meet myself, but I only had to travel to New Jersey to do it, so it was actually close to home, me originally being from Pennsylvania. But this episode is called Close to Home for another reason. You'll hear why shortly. And now a summary of the case. This is brought to you by my friend Megan Goodsight, charlieproject.org. Nicholas Masucci was a businessman, dabbling in nightclubs, restaurants, and auto body shops. He was even a union boss back in the 1940s, a period when various threats were made on his life. Luckily, the danger passed and he prospered, being able to take his family from New Jersey to Florida on many occasions, staying in the nicest places, and meeting many famous people. On September 18, 1974, Nicholas had lunch with his daughter Fran. He said he would be driving into Brooklyn from their home in Kearney, New Jersey. This was a fairly unusual trip for him, and he didn't say who he was going to meet. But Nicholas did say that he would be meeting his son, Fran's brother Joe, at 11 p.m. at a diner down the street from their house. Later that night, actually early the next morning of September 19th, Joe called, saying his father never met him at the diner. Nicholas was never seen again. His car one that he had been renting from a local dealership, was eventually found in Manhattan a few days later. It was wiped clean and no forensics, at least in 1970s terms, could be gathered from it. There have been no suspects named in Nicholas's disappearance since 1974. Over the years, various issues concerning Nicholas, his family, his business connections, and the city of Kearney, New Jersey, have complicated the investigation. His case remains... Unsolved. The interview for this episode is with Nicholas Masucci's daughter, Fran Masucci. Unfound News. The guests of Unfound have begun to receive their free t-shirts with their missing loved ones' pictures and information on the back. Have you seen them? I've posted a few pictures on both the Unfound page and in the Unfound podcast discussion group on Facebook. I also posted a picture on Instagram. The shirts have come out really well, and I'm slowly going down the list, and I want to get to the point where a guest receives their shirt on the very same week that their interview plays. What makes this possible are all the people who have donated to Unfound through Patreon and PayPal. This is where contributions go, projects like these. And if you'd like to get the same shirts these families are getting, please go to unfound-podcast.myshopify.com. Next, does this episode sound a bit different to you? Why do I ask? Because I recorded it on a new Mac laptop. 
This is also the result of Patreon and PayPal contributions. This is going to allow Unfound to be a lot more mobile, meaning it's easier for me to take the program on the road. I'm actually hoping to be able to use this computer to do face-to-face -face interviews with guests if we can meet in person. I hope this gives all of you further proof that I'm using these contributions I've received to better the program and to benefit the guests who appear, and that I'm not using your generous support for vacations in Tahiti. Finally, myself and my business partner started this past week to send messages out about our desire to get unfound into more media venues. I will keep you posted as things transpire. Where you can find Unfound. Unfound is on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, iTunes, Podomatic, Stitcher, Podbean, and Spotify. In particular, please join us on Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern for the Unfound Facebook Live Video Show, which is hosted on the Unfound podcast page, not in the private group. You can email the program at unfoundpodcast at gmail.com. The website, unfoundpodcast.com. Please check out the secret Stephen Kocher episode. The website at Trib Total Media, triblive.com forward slash news forward slash unfound. Unfound has Patreon and PayPal accounts. Thank you to the most recent contributors, Key and Barb. I cannot thank all of Unfound's supporters enough. Unfound Merchandise, Volume 1 and 2 on Amazon in both paperback and ebook form. Let's try to work on getting some great reviews for Volume 2. What do you say? The Playing Cards. Go to makeplayingcards.com forward slash sell forward slash unfound podcast. Of course, I've already mentioned the shirts, but the list of shirts does include the flagship t-shirt, The First Year Cases, that has a collage of everyone from Suzanne Lyle to Jennifer Wilkerson on it. Please check it out. And please mention Unfound on all true crime Facebook pages and other websites and forums. Thank you. So fortunate to have on this episode of Unfound, the daughter of Nicholas Masucci, Fran Masucci. Fran, welcome to Unfound. Thank you so much for having me. You're welcome, Fran. Tell the listeners a little about your father, and maybe just in, generally, uh, in general, what was it like growing up in the Masucci uh, household in New Jersey? Well, let's see. Uh, my father was born in Jersey City to an Italian immigrant family. They had a very large family. Uh, he was a very quiet man. He was very charismatic. Um, I could describe him as being somewhat a cross between Telly Savalas and Frank Sinatra. Uh, he was very well respected. He had a very, very big love for America. Uh, he was in the army and he wouldn't let us buy anything that wasn't American made. Uh, all of our cars had to be American. Uh, he was a, a sharp dresser. Um, mostly he wore alligator shoes, uh, but hmm. even his pajamas would match. Uh, he would have velvet bedroom slippers that we had to special order for him. Um, he had a bit of OCD. He was extremely well-groomed. And uh, he would go back and forth to Florida, uh, mostly two weeks here, two weeks in Florida. Uh, he was very generous. He always wanted to help people that were less fortunate than him. And um, he had a bit of a personality where he would joke around. Uh, if he would uh -huh. like you, he would give you a pet name. Uh, he even had a, a, a nickname for himself. And um, people thought for some reason, I don't know why, but people would say to me when they met him, they felt that he was scary. And uh, of course, I wasn't scared of him. But people said that he had a huge presence. And if he was in the room, you knew it. So maybe that's why. Mm -hmm. Like when he walked into the room, everybody was like, "Hey, there, there is somebody." Kind of, kind of. You could, and, you could actually feel, feel him there. It was weird. <laughs> huh. I have to ask, what was his nickname for himself? Uh, Nicky Gary. That's what everybody called him. And where do you think that came from? You know, uh, they had a produce business back in the twenties. Uh, him and his family, and they called themselves the Gary Brothers. So I guess that just stuck instead of his last name, because it was so hard to pronounce, mm. uh, you know, and <laughs> yeah. in Jersey City back then, mostly uh, the immigrants were Italian, Irish, and Polish, so I guess Gary was an easier name. Sure. That's, yeah. 
Sure. So he, he gave the nickname Nikki Gary. What nickname did he have for you? Oh, uh, well, I'd rather not say, but he had two. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> but they were very fond. They were very fond, and I, and I cherished them both, actually. Okay. How about uh, how did he and your mother meet? Ah, this is a great story. Uh, my father was going to deliver potatoes that his brother forgot to drop off to my grandmother. So they had a stoop in the front of their flat, and my grandmother said to my mother, um, you're getting ready for the dance. There's a guy that's going to come up and drop off the potatoes. I'm going to sit down here with, you know, the company. So my mother answered the door. She said she was, had her hair in pin curls, and she had a robe on. And she opened the door, and she said, there he was in a white suit with a fedora hat and spats with 10 pounds of potatoes in a sack. So she said to him, oh, you must be the peddler. And he picked up his hat and he smiled at her and he said, baby, I'm no peddler. And she <laughs> said, you have 10 pounds of potatoes, don't you, in a sack? That makes you the peddler. So he put them on the table, he chuckled, and he left. Uh -huh. And that night she was uh, going to a dance and with her boyfriend, Joe Mashinsky, and they were dancing, and uh, suddenly she got a tap on the shoulder, and it was my father. And he told this guy to take a walk. <laughs> wow. And Joe took a walk because he had, I told you, he had this charismatic presence. Uh -huh. And uh, he took a walk, and he grabbed my mom, and he said to her, you and I are going to get married, and we're going to have a baby on your birthday, on my birthday. And she said, you're crazy. That's my boyfriend. And he said, no. That's not your boyfriend anymore. I'm your boyfriend now. And they were together ever since. They went together for seven years. And my brother was born a day before my father's birthday. Wow. Crazy. Yeah. Wow. And how long, if, if I may ask, how long were your parents married at the time of your father's disappearance? Oh, God. Uh, well, they had their 25th anniversary when I was 10. So quite so a long time. All right, so about 30 years or something like that, yeah. 31 years, or something yeah. like that. Okay. But um, what kind of businesses was your father in? What did he do? Um, he had a wide array of interests in business and from New Jersey. You already mentioned Florida, and we're going to talk about Florida maybe here in a little bit. But what were some of the things that he was involved in? Uh, once he was your father, you said he was in potatoes before you came along, but once you were born – little girl, a teenager, what was he involved in? Well, uh, when I was young, uh, he had a men's haberdashery on Lincoln Road in uh, Florida, in Miami Beach. Uh, he also had a uniform store in the Eaton Rock Hotel. Uh, he had a nightclub called the Candy Stick Lounge in Miami Beach, which was a pretty hot place back in the day. Um, when I was three, he used to make my mom dress me and tell her to get me ready <laughs> at 11 o'clock. Uh, he would bring me to the bar, they'd put a spotlight on me, and I would tell the band if I wanted to dance to the Holy Gully or the Twist. And I would dance, and the whole crowd would follow my lead. It was just wild. So that was like a, a piece of entertainment for them. And I loved it, of course, you know, but I was very young. And uh, mm -hmm. it was one of his businesses that he had. Mm -hmm. uh, later on, he had some steakhouses called Wild Bill's Steakhouses. Uh, in Florida, he had an auto body business with a friend of his in Jersey City. He owned uh, another nightclub later on called the Rag Doll in Union City. Uh, mm -hmm. He had a restaurant with my uncle before I was born. Um, I can't remember the name of that now, but it was pretty. He must well have been known. a very busy guy. He very he was he was hardly home. Uh, he was always working, doing something. Yeah, very busy. Mm -hmm. Now you had you had told me and um, that you used to travel. Uh, in fact, right before we started this uh, interview, we were talking about uh, hurricanes. Being that you were in Florida as a little girl when a hurricane hit, and of course there was a hurricane that just hit here in the Tampa area last year. You were actually staying in in a hotel, and you were staying in Frank Sinatra's penthouse in Florida right. as a little girl with your family when this hurricane hit. How did how did those things uh, come about, something like that, to get to stay in a place like that? Well, you know, um, 
my father knew a lot of movie stars. Uh, he was always rubbing shoulders with somebody. You know, my mother would say, oh, my God, he's bringing somebody else home. I don't know who's going to be here. Like, <laughs> she, mm-hmm. My mother was very down to earth. Uh, when I was very young, uh, I loved that show, Car 54, Where Are You? I'm familiar with that. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I was crazy about that show. And he brought the stars of the show uh, in Fred, whatever's Gwen was his name, I think. He brought him home with the uh, the shorter guy. Uh, I think his name was Joe something or other. And he, he got my mother to get me up out of bed. And he said, look, look who's here. And I looked at them and I couldn't understand why they didn't have their uniforms on. Because I didn't understand that they were actors. Yeah. And he thought he was doing me a big service by bringing them home that I was going to be thrilled. And I was really kind of disappointed that they weren't really cops. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, uh-huh. Because I was so young, I didn't understand the, you know, the acting thing. Yeah. So uh, they had to explain it to me. And although I was very you know, polite to them, I still was, I remember being very disappointed. Uh, but I was always with my dad and my mom. Uh, I didn't have any children growing up. Uh, I was always with adults. So if they went to a nightclub, they brought me. And years ago, you weren't allowed in the nightclub. So my father would, I guess, pay the guy or whatever. And I would be in the nightclub, and I saw Jerry Lee Lewis. I saw uh, all kinds of acts when I was young. So I was extremely privileged. Doesn't it sound exactly like your normal New Jersey upbringing, (laughs) Francis? In, in Kearney, in New, New Jersey. Jersey. <laughs> now, this was all happening in Miami, Florida. Okay. Uh, we lived there, yeah. And just to also show what kind of guy your dad was, is that uh, your mother had some sort of ailment when she was in Florida, and what did he do? Well, what happened was um, we had two houses. So when we were in Florida, she got sick when I was born with uh, heart failure. And um, she wound up in the hospital in Jersey City, and they didn't think she was going to make it, so they gave her last rites, and I was an infant. So at that time, he was nervous. He flew to Florida when she got better, and he bought her a house there on one floor because he was told that she could not climb steps. So we lived in Florida until I was actually six, and um, she got sick again. So he... uh, had to bring her to Mount Sinai Hospital, and his friend, Dr. Pinks, told him to have this Dr. Philip Samet examine her. And she was diagnosed with mitral valve stenosis and that she needed heart surgery. <clears throat> and uh, my father was informed that the only, excuse me, <clears throat> the only surgeon who was capable of performing the, uh, it's called a uh, commissurotomy, was Dr. Robert Litwack. However, this came with a problem because he had a team that he only operated with. And uh, they had to come out of Mount Sinai, New York. So they would have had to be flown down and put up. And uh, my father did that for my mother. And Dr. Litwack performed the surgery in 1961. He operated on my mom in Jackson Memorial Hospital, uh, where she was in the hospital for months. Uh, I was living in Palacas, Florida with my aunt, my godmother, until she came home. Mm. And then my father decided to sell the house because no one was in the house. And we moved into a penthouse in the Moulin Rouge Hotel in Miami Beach. So when she came home, she had a hospital bed in the living room with a large oxygen tank. And uh, she had a private nurse uh, by her bedside. And the doctors would come and visit her until she could recover and actually go to the doctor's. Uh, so at that time, we had a, a concierge do everything for us. And um, my father's best friend also started to live with us because his wife was sick, my Uncle Jimmy. And my Aunt Gracie got sick with cancer. She was diagnosed then. And uh, they were pretty much down on their luck. So my dad had them come live with us at, at the hotel. And uh, he had quite a bit of children. And they, they all lived with us. Uh, their last name was Napoli. Mm-hmm. So we all lived together, one big happy family. So your father liked to spread the wealth around. He was he was helping out his family. He was helping out his friends. Of course, flying the, this 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 doctor and his team to Florida to help your mother. Did she fully recover? Your mother? 
she did. She did. It took a very long time, though. It was almost yeah. two years. She had uh, 260 stitches. Um, they didn't do heart surgery like they do now where they, you know, open yeah. your chest. Sure. They they would open you uh, on the side and open you like um, from your lung, you know, up like a chicken wing. They yeah. would open you that way. And uh, she, it took a very long time for her to recover. All right. But she recovered and she ended up living several years after that. Oh, she died when she was 1980. She was 81. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Now, I'm sure, you know, and um, being that we've talked about this, and of course we have an interview outline that we uh, follow for all this, you know that this question is coming, and probably some of the uh, listeners are probably already saying, well, this sounds like a very unique kind of family. I just have to ask this so we can just get this out of the way. Was your father in what we might call uh, the mob, the mafia, something like that? You know, there is not not one bit of concrete evidence that that really exists. Um, although there's assumptions, it looks like it maybe, it might seem like it, but as far as I know to this day, mm-hmm. I have no concrete evidence that he was. His name isn't mentioned with any mafia figures in any historical books, mm-hmm. um, you know, or any uh, internet. I, I've gone through the internet a million times. His name never comes up. His nickname doesn't come up either. Um, so, you know, that word never even entered our family. We just mm-hmm. never asked him anything like that. Okay. Now, there is, though, these... Um, it does seem at some point that the FBI did, though, kind of have an eye on maybe not your father, but some other people, and your father's name turned up in those documents, and this was at the Mary... Uh, people go to it. I think it's maryfarrellfoundation.org. And these are FBI documents going back to the 60s and 70s. Um, what can you tell the listeners about that, maybe? Okay. Well, um, a while ago, uh, a body was found uh, in Kearney Police Department, actually had to investigate it. And Sergeant Pat Sweeney on the police department called me and told me that they had found this file. And it was brought to my attention then. Uh, and this was just a few years ago. I've never knew this. I never heard okay. of Santo Traficante. I uh, okay. was supposed to be on a plane with him going to Cuba back again when we were living in Miami Beach in the 1950s or 60s. And I had no idea what this was about. So we called the FBI to come into the Kearney Police Department to explain to us maybe what was going on. Maybe it could help us with the investigation. And the FBI told Pat that there was no investigation on my father, that he wasn't being tailed, it wasn't an associate of this. They were actually doing a, um, of a whole plane inventory of Santo Traficante. So that was a dead end street. Mm-hmm. And in all, I, granted, you were how old when he disappeared? 15 or 16 years old? In I was 19, 16, yeah. 16 years old. But in those maybe last, let's say, as you know, a teenager, 13 through 16, you never heard him mention a, maybe somebody like a Santo Traficant Conte or anybody like that in any conversation that ever came up? Or your Absolutely mother and not. your mother never mentioned that at all either? Oh, my mother, no. My mother mm-hmm. never asked my father any, any mm-hmm. questions at all. He okay. used to tell her she was as green as grass. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, I'm sure the listeners will probably go to that site, and, and it's just it just seems that the FBI was tailing Santo Traficante because he is he was one of the head of the the five families in New York, New Jersey area at the time, and your father and somebody else made it into these documents for some reason, okay? But there is no Correct. alleging that your father ever did anything illegal, at all. Right. Never. Never. Okay, so never. there's no, never, never spent a day in jail or anything like that to your knowledge at all. Not to my, not to my, never ever was arrested while I was alive, ever. Okay, very good. All right. Um, one person we haven't, um, now we, maybe we have to go here too. Is it true that sometime in the 1960s, once again, to, to cover something before he disappeared, did somebody want to try to kill your father? Was he on, did somebody want to knock him off or something? Did that happen? 
actually, it wasn't in the 60s. It was actually in the 40s. In the 40s, uh, okay. In the 40s, yeah. He was the acting president of the local union 1247 at the time. Uh, I do have the newspaper article on that. Okay. And uh, he had police protection because they were threatening his life. Um, apparently, what happened was they wanted him to bring drugs into the dock, and he wouldn't allow it. And they were fighting with him over this. And they were, I guess, you know, bullying him or whatever they were doing. Mm-hmm. And uh, he wouldn't allow it. And he had to have police protection because they were threatening him. Okay. And then I guess that lasted until kind of the um, tension subsided. Maybe, you know, how long that went on, that these threats went on? Did these threats go into the 50s or was just that specific little period in the 40s? Do you know? You know, I really don't know. Um, my mother just told me one incident that that had happened, and that was it. I mean, uh, okay. they were living in Jersey City at the time. My brother was young, and uh, a knock came to the door, and a box was delivered, a white box was delivered to my mother, and my father uh, said, well, what is that? And she said, I don't know. They just delivered a box, and he ran it to the, the water, and he threw it in the water. And uh, he came back and he said, don't accept any boxes from anybody. And she said, well, what's the, what was that? And he said, I don't know. It could have been bombs. Somebody, you know, somebody was trying to kill him. So he, he didn't want her to take anything that would be delivered. Sure. And then she said uh, later on they were out of wake. And this Italian woman came up to him speaking Italian. My father used to speak Italian to him. And she said, did you like the pastry that we oh, gave no. you the other day? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so he threw the pastry in the water. Yeah. It That's was a delicious. good story. Okay. Okay. All right, so I think the listeners now at this point have a good flavor, you know, who your father was, uh, who your mother was, and who you are and what the, this house was like. But we need to talk about somebody else, and that is your older brother, Joe, who was 13 or 14 years older than you. Um, what kind of relationship did you have with him? And what kind of relationship did um, he have with your father? Father, and maybe just give a little background about what Joe, you know, maybe what he was doing in his with his life in around the time that your father disappeared. Well, uh, my brother was really never fond of me. Uh, I don't really feel that he was uh, thrilled about me being born. Uh, he was very physically abusive to me. Uh, all my life, uh, we don't speak to this day, but he he also didn't have a great relationship with my father. He was very comfortable around my uh, uh, very uncomfortable around my father. Um, you could say that he was always like walking on eggshells. There was never any in depth conversations between them. Uh, even when my father would joke around, my brother isn't really too much of a joker. Uh, the only thing that they really ever discussed in front of me was like his education, uh, his wedding plans, money for his cars or his rent. It was never, you know, like, hey, what's going on? Like, there was none of that with them. So it was high tension, I guess you could say. Um, his his uh, relationship with my mother was not good either. Um, he was physically abusive to her as well when my, when my father wasn't around. Uh, he was abusive to his both wives. He broke his first wife's arm and his second wife's leg, um, oh just to give you an idea. Yeah. Um, his personality is very similar to uh, Ray Liotta in the movie Hannibal. Uh, he's sarcastic. Um, and we were scared of him. Mm-hmm. You know? so Okay. Maybe, uh, and I know you've told me several stories about your interaction with your brother, but how about we just keep it to a couple that, you know, maybe a couple confrontations, whether it was just to give an idea maybe what his personality was like. How about we do that, just to give the, the, the listeners an idea? Okay, uh, let's say he, uh, he was, he's arrogant, um, mm-hmm. and he... Let me put it this way. Um, he's very nice at first, and then he has a temper tantrum if he doesn't get his way. Um, he had a, an incident where he had to go down to collect some uh, dry cleaning for my dad before my dad went back to Florida. 
and uh, there was a man that was behind the counter that was Greek at the dry cleaning store, and he didn't know my brother. And my brother, of course, just assumed that he should go behind the counter and start the carousel looking for my father's things because he knew the owner, but the owner wasn't present. And uh, the, the man put his scissors up to him because he was tailoring some clothing. And uh, my brother threw him into the dryer and turned it on while the scissors went into his body. I think he had 240 stitches. And uh, my father called up while I was at the house and he was screaming, where is Jojo? Get him on the phone right now. And I said, he's not even home yet. And when my brother walked in with the dry cleaning, I said, Daddy is screaming. I don't know what's going on, but he's very upset. And he started laughing and he went upstairs. And I didn't know exactly what happened. My brother had to leave and go meet my dad. But when my father came home, he told my mother what happened. Uh, they were going to press charges against my brother. And my father, of course, made it go away. So, yeah. you know, that, that's pretty violent. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. And then there was also, he was, your brother was actually a teacher. Was it in the Kearney School District or somewhere around there where he got he in some trouble as a, as a teacher as well before your yeah, father disappeared? Um, Absolutely. He uh, worked at Hudson Catholic as a, a teacher. That was his first teaching job. And he got into an altercation with one of the children that he was teaching. And uh, it became uh, quite quite escalated. And um, I, I believe they had the police there. That was a big scene. And my father, again, made it all go away. So he went on with his life like nothing ever happened, and he got a teaching job then in Carney High School, and he taught math and history at Carney High. Okay. So that should give the listeners, and he, you know, Joe is uh, going to come up here in a little bit, but that just gives you, the listeners, a little idea about who he was before your father disappeared. And we'll get into yeah. after what happened after your father disappeared. Let's move to September 18th. 1974. What do we now know uh, about that day? In fact, you saw your father that day, and you know what do you know about it? What did he say he was doing? And just give a rundown of what you now know. Okay. Uh, well, let's see. I just came home from school, and I was eating lunch. Uh, my mother just made me a submarine sandwich, and my father sat down, and he said, "Give me a bite." So I gave him a bite, and he said, "Hey, that's good. Make me one." So she started to make him a sandwich, and she said to me, why don't you just give him your sandwich? I'll make you another one. So we sat there, and we ate lunch, and he said, um, later I'm going to meet JoJo down at the Arlington Diner. So he told me, he said, tonight when you see him, tell him I'll meet him there at 11 o'clock p.m. sharp. So I said, okay. And there was nothing unusual. He said he was going to a meeting in Brooklyn, uh, a business meeting. That's all I knew. That's all my mother knew. Uh, he went upstairs, he got dressed, he came downstairs, and he had a white ribbed polo shirt on. Uh, you know, it was back then in the 70s, we all wore polyester. He had um, powder blue um, bell bottoms on, and he had white, uh, like, go-go boots or beetle boots, if you want to call them back then. And... Uh, he, you know, he was leaving. That's it. He kissed me goodbye, gave me three kisses goodbye, and he said, lock the door and uh, tell JoJo I'll see him later. And that was pretty much it. And that was the last time I ever saw him. And so he was supposed to meet your brother, uh, Joe, I guess maybe around 11 o'clock that night at this Arlington Diner that you mentioned, and then he didn't show up there. And we'll get to that in a second. Just some questions, um, you know, maybe about that day as you look back at it now. Uh, was it normal? What day of the week, first of all, was this? September. It was a Wednesday. It was, it was a Wednesday. Wednesday. Would you say that it was normal for you to have lunch with him like that? And I would think that you'd be in school on Wednesday. You remember, you know, if you were yeah, out of school? Yeah, it was like 3 o'clock. We just came home from school. I got out okay. of school at 2.30. Yeah. Okay. And, okay. Um, my brother taught at the same school, so I don't know if he was still in school, you know, at that time or where he was. Oh, so you were going to school at the same place where your brother Joe was teaching? Yes. This would have been the, the second job that he got after the first job that he got kicked out of. Correct. Right, okay. Um, as you remember it, was it normal for your father to drive from Kearney uh, into New York City for business? How often did this happen, and how long of a drive is that to get there? Well, 
he never really used to go to New York City for anything. I mean, if he ever went to New York, it was for pleasure with my mother to go play or something. But it, he would go to Brooklyn. And, you know, that was very rare that he would even go there. And I guess Brooklyn is probably two hours away from where we lived. Okay, so it's traffic. a decent drive. decent drive, sure. Especially if, like you said, it was in the afternoon. If he ate with you at 3 o'clock, yes, he'd be hitting there right at rush hour. Right, so, exactly. Yeah, yeah, so that would be pretty busy. And, of course, maybe um, there aren't as many cars back then as there are now, but still it would be pretty busy. It's still traffic. <laughs> yeah, it's still traffic. It is still New York City, New Jersey traffic, which I, having been to New Jersey many times in my life, I kind of know a little bit about that. Um, yeah, it's gotten bad. <laughs> yeah, but he didn't say where he was going, didn't say who he was meeting, nothing like that. No, he really didn't. No. And to this day, in fact, you still are not sure where he was going and what he was doing, even in 2018. I do not know. And that is why I am still in search of what happens. I mean, it just never goes away. Okay. Now, also, he said that he would be meeting your brother, Joe, later that night at this Arlington diner. diner. Would you say that that is something that, as you remember it, is that something that they usually did? doesn't sound like they had that close of a relationship. So, to me, it sounds like that would be something that's fairly rare. How would you portray it? Absolutely. It was, it was rare because my brother was running for an election at the time, and he had a headquarters up on Kearney Avenue. And they were going to discuss the, I guess, the preliminaries of the election or how they were going to go about it or maybe the rent or maybe the money. I don't know. But uh, they weren't going to discuss it in the house. They were going to talk about it at the diner. So right. I don't know if they were meeting someone else there or what the nature of this was. Okay, but you can't remember them ever meeting at that diner before or anything like that, but maybe a special circumstances. Well, you know, the, the owners of the diner were our friends. Okay. So my father used to go down there. Uh, if my father couldn't sleep, he would go down there and run the register for Alex, and they would talk and hang out. You know, they were friends. Mm -hmm. And um, as a matter of fact, Alex's son worked there. He worked in the kitchen, and Alex was a very strict Greek man who believed in very hard work, and you have to work for what you get. And my dad felt bad for Alex. Uh, Alex Jr. So he, he made him come to our house and uh, he gave him a few of our TVs and he packed up some clothes and he gave him some food and some money and he wanted, because he just like got started in a new apartment and he wanted them to have stuff. So, I mean, you know, we were close with these people. Okay. So for, for my father to go there was not unusual, but for my brother to meet him there was. Okay. And do you remember ever seeing your brother the rest of that day after your father left to go to Brooklyn? Did you see him? Do you remember? Yeah, he uh, he came home at one point to change his clothes or something. And then I told him, I said, Daddy said, I'll meet you at 11 o'clock. And he said, yeah, I know. And that was pretty much it. I, you know, I really didn't interact with him too much because anything could set him off. So you didn't really want to talk to him too much. Okay. So he, your, your father is supposed to meet Joe that night at that diner, and obviously your father does not show up. Um, what happened that night uh, specifically regarding Joe and, and, and when he called home? He called home at, uh, I don't have it specifically in my notes, but like late, early in the next morning, like 2 a.m. something. What can you tell the listeners about all of that? Yeah, it was in the middle of the night. Uh, he called my phone. And he told me to wake up my mother that she wasn't answering her phone. And because uh, we were sleeping, you know, we had to get up for school the next day. So I woke her up and we were both standing in the hallway half asleep. And he was screaming on the phone, hurry up, get her on the phone. So I, I was, you know, dragging my phone to my mother. And uh, he kept saying how to go. I don't know why, where he was going. I don't know what he was doing, but he was very upset and he was yelling. And she got on the phone. She said whatever. He, you could hear him screaming through the phone. And then I got back on the phone, and I said to him, where are you? And he goes, I have to go. And the change dropped. I heard a lot of change drop. Mm -hmm. And he hung up, and he said he was coming home. He told her to put on a pot of coffee, and he wasn't a coffee drinker. So I don't know why he wanted coffee. That didn't make sense to me. However, we went downstairs. She started... Um, 
making coffee in a corningware pot, like a glass pot, and I just stood there and watched the whole thing percolate because we were in shock. And we waited for him to come home. Um, but if he was five blocks away from the diner, you know, that's where we live. We live five blocks away from the diner. He didn't come home for almost two hours. So when he came home, I said to him, where were you? And he said, you. And he put his hand like a stop sign in my face. He said, you, you don't get to ask any questions. So, mm. of course, you know, I just went in the living room. And I paced the whole time, and they were, you know, going through a phone book, and he, he was screaming at her to try to call somebody, and she was saying, who am I going to call in the middle of the night? I mean, I don't even know what to do. And maybe he'll show up in an hour. We don't know if he, you know, we don't know what's going to happen. Why don't we just wait until the morning? And he was very insistent for her to call people. So she finally waited until 7 o'clock or so, and she started to make phone calls. And then, then at some point, he, she called his um, brother, Nucci, which we call Carmen. That's his name. Okay. Anyway, um, and she called him, and he said he, was, he would come over in the morning. And um, everybody else didn't know where he was. I mean, you know, we didn't know. They didn't know. It was just going nowhere. And then my brother just said, don't call anybody else. Just let Carmen come here. You know, let Uncle Nucci come here, and we'll figure it out together. And then... My Uncle Carmen came, and I guess it was 10 o'clock in the morning he came, and they started to talk, and they, they decided what they were going to do uh, with this whole thing. And um, mm -hmm. they sat my mother down, and they told her that they should transfer all the um, cars into, her into my brother's name, and that they should transfer the title of the house into his name, <laughs> and that, the, God bless you, and that the... Uh, the businesses would go into my brother's name, and they they had a, a plan. They were trying to put a plan together, and my mother was so confused, and, you know, she was sick, and her lips kept turning blue, and we would, you know, I was taking a break with her. I was like, you know, this is too much. Why do they not get all this done so fast? What's going on? This is only, he, this he is just, literally hours after your father just didn't show up at the diner, and already they're making these kinds of plans. Yeah, it's like, we, we don't even know what's going on yet. And, and then my brother goes, we're not going to school today. We won't go to school until Monday. We're not going to school. And you, you need to keep your big mouth shut. You're not to tell anybody what's going on here. Nobody's supposed to know that daddy's gone. Do you hear me? And I'm the boss now. You're going to have to listen to me. I'm giving the orders. And I, I turned around and said to him, you are not my father. And you are not going to give me any orders. Because we did not get along. And then he said to me, you're not getting a new car, because my father was going to order me a Mercedes. Um, he said, you're not getting the new car. You're going to take your mother's car. I'm going to take daddy's car. And that's the way it's going to be. And my father had a brand new Mark V at the time. And he had just ordered a Lincoln Continental. And my brother canceled the, um, the order on that car. And he drove my father's car for a little while and then traded it in and got his own. And and uh, he sold my mother's other car. And he got a, her, um, like a Marquis Granada thing, a small car. And he just bought himself a Lincoln. And I had my mother's car. Let me ask you some questions. When Joe did call at whatever time it was that next morning, I guess that would be uh, the morning of September 19th, 1974. Uh, yes, did he ever, when he, when you picked up the phone, being that your mother didn't, didn't pick up the phone, she didn't, she was sleeping. She, I guess she didn't hear it. When you picked up the phone, did he ever ask you, is your father there? No. No. Okay. Cause it seems to me that would be a, a natural question to ask if he didn't, you know, maybe your father forgot to meet him. And so Joe's calling to say, hey, I was supposed to meet Dad over at the diner. He never showed up. He never asked if your father ever came home. Well, my question to Joe, the other question was, uh, where were you if he was supposed to meet you at 11 o'clock? Why are you here at 530 in the morning with us? Yeah. Yeah. Where, where have you been? And that's when he told me that I wasn't allowed to ask any questions. Okay. And my mother was so confused and, and so upset that, that the poor thing, she just, she was... Oh, it was horrible. Horrible okay. situation. 
Uh, you mentioned the, the, the coins dropping on the phone. Is there some significance to that, or is just is that something that's just burned in your memory, or is there something suspicious about that? Because you've mentioned that before. Um, it, yeah, that- it, you know, it seemed to me that uh, years ago the, the phone calls were done, and if he was down at the diner, he could have used the phone. He didn't have to use the pay phone, which was in the hallway, and which was still five blocks away from our house. So why was all this change dropping? Where, where was he? He wasn't. He couldn't have been at the diner making a phone call for a dime. I didn't hear a dime drop. So that didn't make sense to me. And it was just something that stuck in my mind. That's very. You know, all these uh, years. That's very sharp on your part, Fran. I, I give you a lot of credit for that. That's very sharp to notice that at the time and still remember that all these years later. That. Yeah, if you know the diner people, it seems that they would just say, yeah, use the phone, no problem. You don't have to use a pay phone. Yeah, because when I was down at the diner and I needed to call my parents, I would just use their phone. They never said no to me. Okay. All right, so we have all of that. Now, the, now we should be clear that when your father drove into Brooklyn, if that's what he did, uh, he didn't drive his own car. He had been borrowing a car. Um, where did he get that car from? And why was that? And was that car eventually found? Uh, what happened was my father's car was in the shop from Amphion Motors. And the loaner car that they gave him was the Marquis Brougham. And that's the car he was using for a few days. Um, he had a big problem. If the car rattled, they had to fix all the rattles. It would drive him crazy. So that's, I guess, what the car was in for. Or maybe a wheel alignment, whatever. <clears throat> and, um, excuse me. <clears throat> And then, uh, yes, the car was found. It was found uh, on the 27th, I believe, of that month, uh, which wasn't too many days later. My brother told me while he drove me home from school that they found the car um, and that there was no fingerprints in the car and that daddy was there was no blood in the car. There was nothing in the car. We just found the car. And he told me that it was um, found uh, by my Uncle Jimmy's home which was not true. It was found more towards the Port Authority in Manhattan. All right, just for anybody that is not maybe that versed in how New York City is set up, and I've only been there once. He was headed to Brooklyn, but the car was found in Manhattan. Generally, how far away are those two places from each other, even though they're technically the same city? Uh, It could be an hour and a half. It could be two hours, depending on traffic. All right, so they are are not close to each other. So maybe your father said he was going to Brooklyn, maybe made it to Brooklyn, then ended up by Manhattan. But you had told me there's a reason uh, you think that the car was parked where it was. What was your instinct telling you regarding where it was, where the car ended up? Well, the car was close to the Port Authority from walking distance. So if you needed to get on a bus, you could get right on a bus and go anywhere. Yes. Were the keys found in the car? Do you remember? Did anybody ever tell you any of your father's possessions found in the car? Do you remember any of any of that? No. uh, As far as I know, there was nothing in the car. And I don't know if the keys were in the car, to tell you the truth. That was never mentioned. Um, Sergeant Sweeney never said that. Okay. Speaking of Sergeant Sweeney and the police, um, who filed the missing persons report? Did the police come to your house? Um... How seriously did, did they take it? What was your interaction with the police over that time? Uh, I didn't have, or nor did my mother have any interaction with the police. My brother was uh, on an auxiliary police uh, force at the time. Uh, his best friend was the chief of police. So they sent police to the house. Uh, my brother told us to go upstairs and stay in the guest room. Uh, his reasoning for that telling my mother that she was sick and that she would get too upset over this. He didn't want her to have a heart attack. So he said he would handle the report and he said that the FBI was downstairs and we were trying to listen like two kids. We were trying to listen up against the door to hear what they were saying. And, um, of course we couldn't hear much. And, uh, my brother gave the police report and, um, he told us that the investigation was, you know, going to be done. And of course, we believed him. Yeah. Why, why wouldn't you know? Why wouldn't you believe that? Of course. 
So we thought that they were, we thought, you know, in our minds that people are diligently looking for him. Um, come to find out later when uh, the body was uh, found and, and I met Pat Sweeney uh, after all these years, which was only seven years ago, uh, he showed me the police report and the police report had the wrong clothing and the wrong description of my dad, the wrong weight, um, the wrong clothing. And uh, I just didn't understand why anybody would uh, falsify a police report when you're diligently trying to look for somebody who you love. Especially when it's the son of the person who's missing that's giving out all the information. Exactly. And he didn't see him before he left. All he had to do was ask what he was wearing. Yeah, that's and, true. You know, what, that's what true. He didn't see your father strange. that day, right? Right. And, you know, the other thing I thought was odd was he, he said he had loafers on. My father didn't own a pair of loafers. My brother wore loafers. My father wore alligator shoes or Volari shoes that matched his outfits or, you know, he was a very sharp dresser. This man did not have a pair of loafers. So I don't even know where that came from. Why was, you said the FBI, your brother said that the FBI was downstairs. Why was the FBI involved? Because he said that the car was found in Manhattan, and when it crosses state lines, the, the FBI gets involved. Okay. Did you find out that that was actually uh, proven to be true, that the FBI was involved in the investigation? Was that true? No, it was not true. The FBI never came to my house. They were never in the kitchen. They, they didn't do any investigation on my father. All right. So when he told you that back, maybe a few or the day, next day or a few days after, when he when the police were there, he said the FBI were there and the FBI weren't. Correct. Okay. And I do have to ask because I'm sure the the listeners are wondering, um, how is it that your brother was allowed to be on the auxiliary police force when he had had a problem with uh, the guy at the dry cleaners? And then even in his teaching job being, you know, almost throwing a student out a window. And I realized that your father kind of smoothed those things over. But how did that ha How did he continue to be a part of that police force? You know, I, I ask myself these questions uh, to this day. And I had found out recently that my brother was arrested previously, not too long ago, maybe 10 or 20 years ago. And yet he worked for the government. so. There it is again. I mean, I guess they overlooked things back then, or maybe they didn't have the technology to do background checks like we have now. But I know that there was a problem there, and I, I definitely know my father smoothed it over, but I don't know if he could make police records disappear, or maybe they never wrote the police department, wrote it up at that point. I, I don't know what happened because I was young, and, and I didn't, God forbid, I should ask questions about that. That would be, no. That you wouldn't do that. You wouldn't bring that up. So it's a mystery. Okay. I felt like I had to ask you that because I, I'm sure that's going to stump some people. Uh, well, at any point, yeah, it stumps you too. All these years later, it still does. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, at any point, and once again, I know I already asked you this before, but I, I feel like I have to ask you again just in case. Uh, at any point, did anybody that you thought might be a sp suspicious character come by your house and and say that, you know, we're going to take care of you. We realize your father disappeared, but we're going to take care of you. Anything like that? Did No one ever came to our house and said anything about my dad, period. No. No one. The only person that came to our house was Uncle Carmine with my brother. That was it. Nobody came. And we weren't allowed to tell anybody for almost a year, not his family, no one, that he disappeared. My brother didn't want the family to know. And when you say the family, you mean like extended family, maybe like cousins, somebody like that? No, his, his own brothers and sisters. His own brother. brothers and sisters. He, right. He, and he so what telling, were you telling them in that year that you weren't allowed to say anything? That we would say he was still in Florida. Okay. All right, so uncle, your Uncle Carmine, and we're going to talk about him in a second. Just to be clear, he is your uh, father's brother, Carmine. Correct, younger uh, brother. Oh, Older, 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 or younger than your father. younger, his younger brother. All right, so he was a brother of 
your father, and he was telling you not to tell his other siblings that Nicholas had disappeared. That's correct. Okay. It's very strange. Now that we're talking about him, why don't you tell uh, the listeners a little bit about your Uncle Carmine, how you knew him as, uh, as a kid, and what role did he play in your life uh, before your father disappeared, how close did he live, anything that you think uh, the listeners should know about your Uncle Carmine? Uh, he was close to my father. Um, they were always in businesses together. Um, my father's brothers always worked for my dad, and uh, Carmine worked for my father as well. And he would come over our house more than anybody in the family because he was he was uh, lived in Jersey City, and uh, he was naturally just much closer to my dad. So, you know, he was. I don't know. He wasn't that close to my brother, but they became very close after this. All right. And we'll get and we'll get to that, but you'd say that he was a guy that you trusted uh, as a little girl as a you know, early teens. You knew him, sure. had talked to him and did he have any kids Absolutely. that you knew? Did he have any yeah, kids? Yeah, of course, my sure he has uh, uh, three children and I was close with one of his daughters, very close with one of his daughters at one time. And uh his son, a very handsome guy. We used to brag about how good looking he was. He looked like a movie star when he was young. Um, you know, we loved them. I mean, you know, his wife, I loved his wife to death. And we were close, yes. We went on vacation together, and there was no animosity between us. And you said that he worked for your father. And what particular uh, capacity did he did he manage, uh, like a nightclub, or did he manage a restaurant? What did he do uh, with your father, specifically? Uh, specifically, they had a numbers business back in the day, and that's what he did. He booked numbers. Okay, so he was uh, in the bookie. He was a bookie, just to yeah. All right, so your father had some sort of bookie business, which people don't know what that is. Kind of taking cash on games, points, yeah, things like bets. you know, all right, bets, that, taking bets. bets or, okay, right, taking so that was something else working. that your father was involved in. Okay, and and your fa- and your uncle Carmine kind of ran that for your uh, father. Yeah. At any time, yeah. at any time, um, maybe shortly after your father disappeared, did your uncle Carmine, who once again was very close with your father, ever offer up any ideas as to what could have happened to your father? Well, he didn't to me. Uh... He took me to Atlantic City and we had dinner and I asked him, I said, what do you think happened to daddy? And he just shook his head and he said, I don't, I don't know. But that wasn't true because he told my mother a different story. Uh, When my father disappeared, my mother didn't have any money coming in. There was a lot of things that were going on. My mother was not a business person. And uh, she went to my uncle Nucci for help. And she said to him, you know, we don't have any money coming in and he said well I'm really sorry but I'm giving the extra money that would have gone to you in other words because I'm taking over the business to my son and she said well when Nikki comes back which was my dad mm-hmm. when Nikki comes back he's going to be furious and he said Nikki is never coming back he was chopped up and put in sheep's head bay and she said she couldn't believe what he said to her she was so upset that when she turned around to cross the street she said I almost got hit by the bus She said, I got in the car and I cried like a baby because I couldn't believe he said that to me. Now, he knew her since they were young, since they were 17 years old. Why, even if that were true, why would you ever say that to somebody, especially a heart patient? Your mother had to be shocked. Absolutely shocked. Absolutely devastated. And she Mm -hmm. came home and she never told me that until, I guess it was, hmm. Eight months later, she told me what happened. She said, Daddy's not coming home because Uncle Mochi told me this. And I went hysterical. I mean, I wound up in the hospital uh, with my stomach. They thought I had appendicitis. They thought it was my gallbladder. I had many stomach issues after that. And, um, I mean, that's a horrifying thing to say to anyone. Yes. Even if it is true. Yes. And why, why would they do that? Well, you know, he didn't deserve to be chopped up in pieces. And, and no one, no one, no one deserves that. And 
just as a, a matter of the investigation, did you, did she or you ever pass that along to the police? And yeah. did you ever talk to your brother Joe about what your uncle Carmine had said? Yes, and my brother knew what Carmine said, and he never repeated it. He never, uh, never said anything, and he couldn't understand why my mother told me because I was hysterical. So when I was hysterical, he picked me up. It was one of the only times he was ever nice to me. He picked me up, and he brought me upstairs, and he put me to bed. And he said, you need to go to sleep, like I could go to sleep at that time after I found that out. Are yeah. you kidding? You don't put somebody to bed when they're that upset. So. Um, and do you, do you know yeah. if the police was this, this something the police ever looked into at all? That, I, I mean, I don't even know where you would start, but that that might have been a true statement uh, at all. No, the police never did an investigation. None. When Pat Sweeney uh, took over the case, he could not find the file on my father uh, for a long time. And he kept calling me up and saying to me, I'm looking, I'm looking for the file. It's just really weird that I can't find it. And he called me up one day and he goes, Fran, you know, I found the file. And I said, oh, thank God, where was it? And he said, it's the strangest thing. It was in our storage building in a filing cabinet that was way in the back, all by itself, just thrown there all by itself. He said, and I opened it up. He said, I got chills when I opened it up. I could not believe that it was your father's um, And what year file. What year did Mr. Uh, Officer Sweeney take over the investigation? What year do you think this was that that happened? It was about seven, eight years ago. Wow, so maybe, that, re maybe wow, that recently. Wow. Yeah, oh yeah. It was just recently. Okay. So he said this case was never investigated. Uh, no one did anything with it. And then when he showed it to me, because I had to go into the station and looked at the file, I couldn't believe it. I said, this, this isn't even the right description. If you were looking for somebody, mm. you wouldn't be looking for my father. And that's where we go back to what you said about your, how your brother, when he filled out the original police report, or he didn't technically fill it out, but he was the person giving the information. That's when you found out that he had uh, misled the police in what your father was wearing, etc. You didn't find that out correct. until about seven, eight years ago. That's correct. I never knew. Here I am thinking the whole time the FBI has been investigating the case. So I called the FBI in, and that's when they told Pat that there was no investigation. Hmm. Which okay. I thought was even more odd, because in the 80s, um, back in the 70s, actually, 77, I started to do uh, private investigations for a living. And I became very curious about this case. Of course, it's my father. And I went everywhere. I flew to Florida. I asked all of his friends. I, I went to New York. I asked them. I started hanging around with his best friend. I was hanging around with Carmen. I was trying to get any information on this or a feel of something, even if you got a little hint of anything unusual. And I called the FBI back in the 80s for, you know, an investigation. Was it done? And they sent an agent to me. And he, uh, he sat with me for quite a while, uh, a couple of weeks, and we went over some files. And it was more actually of him asking me questions about my dad more than he was giving me about my dad. And he said to me that uh, they had a lot of information about my father, but they, he didn't know if any of this was uh, confirmed, so he was confirming it with me. And then when he left... Uh, he, he threw his business card on the ground and he said to me, um, sometimes you should just let a sleeping dog lie. Yeah. And, and let's leave like, it right. That's, we're going to get to that and let's leave it right there for th that moment. Okay. So I want the listeners to remember that comment. We're going to get to that in, in a moment. Okay. So we're going to come back to that Fran in, in a few minutes. Um, okay. I do want to, um, Go, you know, continuing to go through some of these names that you've already mentioned. You had mentioned Uncle Carmine, so we talked about him. Let's talk about Jimmy Napoli. Uh, you had already mentioned him early in the conversation. Who was he? How did your father know him? Um, was he uh, was he a family member or just a close friend of your father's? Tell the listeners a little bit about him and what he had to do with any of your father's businesses. Uh, he was my father's best friend. Uh, my father gave us specific information about. Jimmy, if, if God forbid he died 
uh, not to go to his brothers, to go to Jimmy. Uh, he trusted Jimmy more than he trusted his own family. And uh, he said that he would take care of us. Uh, he would take care of all the arrangements, of funeral arrangements, or whatever needed to be done that he had control. Um, so, you know, I did go to Jimmy uh, about a year later. My brother kept saying that uh, he found this piece of paper in my mother's documents, my father and mother's documents, saying that there was loans outstanding by all these people that owed him money. And uh, my mother was trying to call the people up and ask them could they pay her back because we didn't have any money coming in. And at all, even the businesses that he was in, uh, all of his business partners were saying that they, they got paid back. Oh, no, no, they did this. It was all, you know, nobody wanted to pay any money. Yeah. And she couldn't get it. I mean, she had art condition. Where was she going? So um, I got dressed one day. I just had enough. My brother and I had had a big fight, and he wasn't in the house any longer. And uh, I went to Jimmy's house, and I said, you know, there's this piece of paper, all these people owe me money. I, I don't know what's going on here. And he, he got everybody to start paying us back. I mean, they paid us back for years. That's how we survived. Yeah, and in fact, one of these uh, loans ended up being like five figures. I don't know if we wanted to get yeah. into the actual amount, but uh, it was a considerable uh, money that you eventually collected from somebody that, that your yeah. uh, father had loaned out. Absolutely. And 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 Jimmy uh, Napoli uh, was the guy who caused that to happen. Did he at any time offer you any uh, explanation, any theory as to what happened to your father at all? Do you remember? No, and uh, he was and seemed genuinely concerned and, and sincere when he said that he didn't know where he was. He was uh, as mu much puzzled as we were. That's what the impression that he gave me. Um, I did keep staring at him. I would tell you that. I, I kept staring him down, and he said to me, why are you looking at me that way? And I said to him, I know you since I'm an infant. I can look at you any way I want, can I? And he did squirm a little bit, He and he was not a man to get nervous. But I guess he felt that I was looking him accusatorily, uh, mm -hmm. and he... Um, you know, he felt uncomfortable with it uh, because I I'm no I'm no fun, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm no picnic when I get mad. I'm half Irish and half Italian. You you should run. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, um, all I have to say about him was I had conversations afterwards with him, uh, endearing conversations about when my aunt Gracie died because she was very close to my mother, and he got remarried to to Jeannie, his wife. And uh, when they were getting separated, he called me and he poured his heart out to me. Um, you know, th this wouldn't be something that somebody that might have killed your father would want to talk about to you. I mean, my Uncle Mitch, never told me anything endearing. Neither did my brother. So... So he had no... Yeah, he, he once again, he also... Not only did he not know what happened to your father he had no idea who your father was going to see that day in brooklyn no idea no he didn't say, he didn't say he didn't know he didn't he didn't talk about that at all all right what did uh maybe this is a good question uh, time to ask this question what did happen to all of these businesses that we ran through early in the conversation being that your father disappeared you know who ended up owning them what ended up happening to them most of them fell apart uh, and went to the partners that he was in partners with. Uh, one guy owned the steakhouse. I don't know if he went bankrupt. Uh, his name was Skippy. And um, my uncle wound up with the uh, the bookie part of the business. Um, Sonny took his building back and told my mother that she didn't really own it because she didn't have the title to it. So all these businesses just went by the wayside, and we wound up with none of that money and none of those businesses. Uh, the Candy Stick Lounge went out when I was a kid. He sold that years and years before that. And um, the Rag Doll was also sold way, way, way before that. And uh, it went to my godfather. And after it went to my godfather, it went to a family friend. So that club went for a very long time. But, you know, it was already sold. Um, and the um, men's clothing stores were sold before this happened. So... 
he was going to actually open an IHOP. He was thinking about opening an IHOP before he vanished, and we were talking about that. We were also talking about maybe we should move to South Carolina because the weather was better for my mother. And, uh, of course, those plans never came to fruition. Oh, they never happened. Uh, have you ever entertained the idea that maybe one of those people he was in business with, maybe one of those business partners was the person who might have done something to him? I mean, did you ever look into that? Yeah, I went over all that with Pat. I gave him yeah. names that he should look into and uh, things that should have been done. However, what happened was um, Pat was a uh, an evidence officer, and he was given this investigation part-time. So he couldn't devote his whole life to it, but he did quite a bit of information as much as he could. Uh, you know, he would talk to me a lot about it. He questioned uh, my brother about it, and he felt that people needed to be questioned. So he felt that he wasn't a detective, and that should be something for a detective to do. So what happened was when he was retiring, he told me that he called in the state police and he spoke to two officers who were going to do the questioning in this case. And he also introduced me to uh, Mike Gonzalez, who's the detective on the case now. And these people were supposed to be questioned. So at that time, we waited. I guess I waited about nine months. And then I called the state police and I still, I spoke to um, a Lieutenant Anadopoulos, I think his name was. And um, he told me that they were not going to do any type of investigation on this case because they don't work on cold cases and that I was misled and that it should go back to the uh, Hudson County Prosecutor's Office. So at that point, I called uh, the Hudson County Prosecutor, who was Michael D'Andrea, and I spoke to him and he said he would get the file from the county police and start working on the case. I guess I waited eight months. I called them, him again. He told me that the county police never forwarded him the file. So then I went back to Carney and I spoke to Detective Gonzalez and he said that Mike D'Andrea never requested the file. So we it's, went back uh, and forth. Nobody wants to take any out. responsibility. I hear that a lot in a lot of these cases. And and it's it's torture. Yeah, it is it's, torture. It's absolute torture. And uh, I, I'm still going around in the mulberry bush. Now I'm told that uh, I said, are you going to investigate this case? It's been three years. Um, Mike Gonzalez told me that he would definitely go forward with the case, but he's always too busy. He's got, you know, things going on in his own town that he's taken care of. And this case is 42 years old. You know, it's something that's not important. Not to him anyway. Yeah. And, um, so I asked if he was going to do any questioning, and he said to me, at this time, there's no new evidence. So the case remains an active, inactive investigation. So I called the Cold Case Society in, uh, on the Internet, and I got a response from uh, New York, Pennsylvania, and some students were interested in working on the case. So I requested the case he worked on with Mike Gonzalez, and unfortunately, uh, his deputy chief, McAvee, um, sent an email to them and said that uh, the case uh, remains open, uh, there will be no uh, investigation done, and that he could not work with them. So they're refusing to close the case at this point, and they just want to keep it an active, inactive investigation, which actually puts me in checkmate. Yeah. All right. So that's where the case stands right as of right now. Correct. Okay. Let's uh, go through something else that I think is interesting about uh, that night that your father disappeared. This has to do with the owners of the diner. At any time uh, you got to speak with them, did any of them, whoever was there that night, did they ever see Joe in the vicinity of the diner that night that he was supposed to be meeting your father there? Uh, Pat said that there was no questions asked. They never, never went to the diner. No one ever went to the diner and asked any questions. Okay. Did you have an opportunity at any time to speak to the owners back in the 1970s? You yourself? I, I did go to the diner and I asked them and Alex told me he never saw my brother that night. 
So okay. I brought that up to my mother, and she said, don't say anything to your brother. Just let's just not even go there. The police are handling this. Let them take care of it. Okay. Because so, I, used to eat, uh, I used to eat in the diner every Sunday. We would bowl next door, and then we would go have, you know, cream of turkey soup. They had the best. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, yeah. So you would think that if you, your brother was waiting there for your father to show up, somebody would have seen him. But nobody saw I, I would him. imagine, yeah. Yeah, right. and then nobody on top of that, we already mentioned that when he called at 2 in the morning or whenever it was, he had called from a pay phone, meaning he probably wasn't at the diner. So that that's something that, that will continue to stick out. Uh, earlier you'd mentioned that once, you know, you uh, your brother and your Uncle Carmine, they seemed to act very quickly regarding all of the money and possessions uh, that your family had, that your father had, I should say. And, you know, you were supposed to get a car. That was canceled. There are a lot of things that were uh, maneuvered around, uh, you know, college money, savings, money for your mo- mother. Um, you do have a particular story regarding uh, car insurance. And then what was the final straw for f- w- between you and him uh, that you uh, kind of became estranged from him for several years. Why don't you explain that to the listeners? Well, I had to go to work. Um, I was in a work program that he put me into, and uh, he would drive me to school in the morning, and then I would go to Newark. I was a travel agent, and uh, I was driving my mother's car. And I told my boss, I said, I don't know how I'm ever going to afford car insurance. And she said to me, well, you know, it's not that expensive. I mean, you make about $100 a week here. And I said to her, yeah, but, you know, $1,000 a month, how how are you going to do that? She's like, who told you that? That's crazy. So I said, my brother told my mother that that's what she has to pay every month, that he pays the bill. So she said to me, please bring in the policy. So I did. And she said, you have Aetna insurance. You have full coverage for all of your cars. And all of it is $425 a year, not a month, not $1,000 a month. So I looked at her and I said, are you kidding me? Like, I said, well, there must be some mistake. So I went home and I showed my mother and my mother called my boss and she went over it with her and she said, okay, no problem. So that night uh, I was eating Chinese soup. Uh, We had um, egg drop soup and my mother used to put it in a soup tureen so it would be very hot. And uh, she put the cover on it. And I started to eat the fried rice, and my brother walked in the door, and he said, give me some. So he started eating some of my fried rice, and I said to him, oh, by the way, let me ask you a question. I said, how much is car insurance? He said, why are we talking about car insurance? I said, well, why don't you tell your mother how you've been ripping her off this whole time? And he stabbed my hand with a fork, and I threw the hot soup in his face, and we went into a big fight in the kitchen. And I was slipping and sliding all over the soup. My mother was trying to grab him off of me, and he was, and it was it was really bad. I mean, he 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 broke his hand on my head, and there was blood all over the kitchen. And she was screaming, "Get out of my house! Get out of my house! This is it! I've had enough! Get out of my house!" So he got out, and she called the police, and Chester Potter, who was his best friend and the chief of police said that he was not going to send the car down and he would not make a report on Joey. And we had to fight it out for ourselves. I mean, she took me to the hospital. Um, I had a concussion and I mean, I was in bad shape. I had a black eye. I was in concussion. And yet in a few more weeks, I was in his wedding. So they had to get me better and cleaned up so I could be in the wedding. But I actually didn't want to be in the wedding. So we went to the wedding, and at the wedding, they knew that I had sang Daddy's Little Girl to my father at his engagement party when he was first married, and that this song meant a lot. And yet, they didn't tell me that they were going to do that for the Daddy-Daughter dance, and I wound up screaming, you know, oh my God, I can't believe they're playing this song, and I I wound up in the bathroom crying. And it, it was just a cruel cruel thing to do to somebody. I mean, my sister-in-law wasn't very nice to me either. And after that, we just never talked to them after that. You were estranged from him after that. And really the culmination of this is he was ripping you off for your car insurance money. It was $425 a year 
and you and your mother were giving him a thousand dollars a month. Yes. Which is crazy, especially considering crazy. it was probably like 1975 or 1976, something like that, you know, in 1970s dollars. Yeah. yeah, it's crazy money. But uh, so that was the final straw. You became uh, estranged from him. Now, yeah. how did you two eventually, though, come back into contact with each other? It was like about maybe 10 or 11 years later, and maybe we can start uh, this conversation there. Uh, how did that all happen? Well, uh, And this is, by the way, the listeners should know, this is going to lead us to the second part of Joe's underhandedness, and then it's going to get a little uh, a coincidence regarding this entire case that we'll talk about in a second. But how did you and Joe end up speaking again? Well, what happened was uh, I had gotten married and moved uh, down the shore, and I had just leased a brand new uh, 7 Series BMW, and it was 1988, and uh, I was pulled over uh, for driving in Manchester. Uh, They said that the car was unregistered and that I had to be detained at the police station and that I had bail. And uh, I was like, <laughs> my car is costing me eight sixty five a month, and you're, you're telling me it's a stolen car? Uh, this is ridiculous. So they were, it was a Saturday night, and my husband was at my mom's house, and I didn't want to call my mother because I didn't want to upset her. So I called my friend from up north to come and bail me out, my friend Debbie. And uh, she was on her way. She said, oh, my God, I'll get dressed, and we'll come down. Me and Paul will come down and get you. In the meantime, uh, I told them, you know, my brother lived in Whiting. I said, my brother lives here. They were like, Joe? And I was like, yeah. And they said, he's one of the councilmen here in town. I said, what? So I said, well, why don't you go wake him up and tell him that he has to come here and bail me out? So they, it was Father's Day. I'll never forget that. It was so odd. They went there and they uh, they woke him up and he did come. And uh, he was reprimanding me. What are you doing in my town at 2 o'clock in the morning, driving a car? What are you doing here? I said, don't listen. I'm a married woman. I, I, we're not going over this. You're not my boss. Do you want to bail me out or not? Here's my American Express card. Go across the street. Get the money. Here's my code. And just get me out of here. So he did. He got me out. And then we went to the diner. And we sat and we talked. And I said to him, you really need to make up with your mother. This is just ridiculous at this point. She cries every holiday. And um, you need to be nice to your mother. I mean, we've had enough tragedy here. So he, he agreed. And uh, eventually, slowly but surely, they started to come around again, him and my sister-in-law. And uh, we finally, you know, reacquainted with my niece. She was 13 years old then. Um, and we thought everything was great because he was so sweet to us, which was so unusual for him to be nice to us. And I said to my mom, you know, Maybe because he's a family man now, things have changed. You know, you got to give the guy a second chance. Let's, you know, I, I'm happy we're all back together and everything's going well. And little did we know, my brother had devised a plan with my sister-in-law to steal our identities and take all the equity out of our houses behind our backs. So while they were taking us out to dinner and while they were buying us nice presents for Christmas and birthdays, it was our money that they were buying it with. Oh and we were devastated once again. And how long did this take to, uh, did you, how long did it take to find this out from the time that uh, you got pulled over and then finally ran into him again to you found out that he was ripping you off once again? How long did it take? Uh, how many years was that, would you say? From 1988, I found out uh, in 1992 that he was ripping me off. Uh, what she was doing, my sister-in-law was, she was taking the loans from whatever loan she would take. She took out bank loans, credit cards, uh, along with the equity out of her own home. And they abandoned their own house and they, they fled. And we didn't even know where they were when, when I found out that, you know, we were, we were uh, bamboozled. Uh, this became uh, a real problem because the jurisdictions were all different counties and, and to, to prosecute them uh, would have been misdemeanors in each town. 
so they redacted it all back to Ocean County. Uh, some of these banks were out of state, and it, it became a real problem. So I called in the Secret Service because it was credit card fraud. It was bank fraud. Then the FBI got involved. It was it was a nightmare. And um, this went on for years. We, I had several different attorneys taking care of this case. They didn't even know how to go about it because it was so crazy. And uh, the Secret Service told me it was a perfect white-collar crime. They'd never seen anything quite like it. So I was one of the first identity fraud victims in the state of New Jersey. Wow. And so he did this with his, I guess that was still the wife that he had gotten married to back in the 1970s. And you had already told the listeners that at some point he broke her arm or something. They had a domestic... He broke her leg. Broke her leg. leg. He broke my first sister-in-law's arm. Okay. All right. So he ripped you off, uh, you know, over that period of time. And did you, I mean, you confronted him with this. Did he run off? You said about the jurisdictions and everything. Did he like vanish? What did he do? Yeah. What happened was, uh, this is how it came about. Um, my mother was very, very sick with her heart and she started to go into respiratory failure and I had been working two jobs and I couldn't take her to the hospital. I didn't have coverage. So I called my sister-in-law and I said to her, could you please take my mom to the hospital? She doesn't sound good over the phone. So she said, okay, yeah, I'll go pick her up. So she picked her up. She said she brought her to the hospital. Now, I had her doctors waiting at the emergency room for them. And they called me up. The doctors called me up and said that they still didn't make it to the emergency room. So I was like, well, I'm puzzled because my sister-in-law went there over two hours ago. So I kept calling my sister-in-law's car phone and she wasn't answering. So I finally got a ride to brick hospital where where it was going on and she finally arrived about 20 minutes later with my mother saying that she brought her to Point Pleasant Hospital by accident. Uh, I I made it very clear what hospital to go to. I I actually think she was waiting for my mother to die. So by the time my mother got there she was blue and they raced her in on the gurney because her pulse ox had fallen so low. So I went into the emergency room with my mom And when I came out, of course, I gave my sister-in-law my pocketbook, and my sister-in-law was going through my check register, which I thought was really unusual. And I said, hey, what the hell are you doing? And she threw my bag down on the floor, and she ran out of the hospital, and and I never saw her again. After that, they changed their phone number. They took their house. They took the equity out of their house, and they, they went somewhere else. I don't know where they went to at the time. They took off. And it was just crazy. It was, it's like a book. Right. And what we found out many years later is that uh, his wife, was I, I believe it was that woman, she tried to fake her own death. That's and, correct. She, uh, she did. She faked her own death. Uh, I was in got... a, uh, a store, and I heard my name, my last name going off, and I was like, what the hell could that be about? So I went outside, and uh, I called the radio station. And uh, they told me that Mary Masucci was arrested for defrauding her own death uh, for $700,000 in the the Ocean County. She was in the Ocean County Jail. And uh, I had actually worked with the Attorney General on that case. And uh, it was it's in the Asbury Park Press. It's on Google. Um, Yeah. Yeah, you can find it. She defrauded her own death. Yeah, you can find it. Uh, through all of this, I mean, this is a, a big question, and we still have uh, some more to get into, and, and I'm going to tell my story uh, very shortly. I will, of course, tell the longer version of it in the summation. But um, all those years from 1974, what between you and your brother, he stabs you, 1988 through 92, he's ripping you off. You found out that he's ripped you off. In the back of your mind, were you th- thinking possibly that he did something to your father? Of course. How could you not think that? This is berserk. I mean, who even thinks of these things? It's way off the chart. Mm-hmm. You know, as uh, you, you might want to say my father was associated with or, or in the mob or whatever assumptions people would make, my father wasn't a criminal like that. He, he didn't raise us like this. He told us that he was raised on the street because he didn't know any other way, but we were going to go to college and we were going to be legitimate people. He would never, ever approve of any of this. Not at all. No. No. Right. And especially, I mean, especially, especially, especially 
doing against a fellow family member, a sister or something. I mean, oh, and my doing this to us, forget yeah. it. It's just, it's totally, totally taboo. Okay. Now, what the listeners need to know, and this is something that I did not even dis- discover until after uh, Fran and I talked the first time. And in fact, once I found this out, I called her immediately back, didn't I? I called you immediately yeah, you when I. There's a weird coincidence in this story that the listeners should know about. I discovered I have an aunt and uncle who are now deceased who lived in New Jersey. And I, when I first started talking to Fran, I admitted to her that, you know what, I know New Jersey because I have an aunt and uncle that lived there. They're both deceased. My uncle That's Russ right. my uncle Russ died, I think, in 2003, 2004. He had a very uh, a lung problem uh, that, that eventually uh, killed him. And then my aunt, Sidney Ann, who is my father, um, my father's name is also Ed Denzel. Uh, she died, I think, in 2009, 2010. Their last name was Shellhammer. Well, in my just doing a little reading about Fran's brother, after I got off of the phone with her the first time, I discovered, and brace yourself, listeners, but my Uncle Russ, who I knew very well while he was alive, he and Fran's brother Joe, the one that you've heard all these horrible stories about, were actually very good friends. And nobody was more shocked uh, than I was. And in fact, uh, Fran has mentioned that uh, Joe was a councilman in New Jersey. In fact, my uncle, I believe, helped Joe get that position. And in fact, they ran together on a ticket for something, uh, for some county office or something like that in 1992. So around the time that Joe is ripping Fran and her mother off this identity theft, and of course Joe's wife is doing it. My Uncle Russ, who I would never suspect him to ever be friends with, my Uncle Russ was a stand-up guy, was friends with this guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I owned up that to you that day. That was really a weird conversation we had, wasn't it, Fran? It was really, really strange. I mean, there's been so many coincidences around this story, and none of them actually shock me anymore because it's just bizarre. Yeah. And well, you d- know, yeah, please continue, please. I'm sorry. How many tragedies have I had that aren't, you know, like normal? The the things that I've been through are horrific. Yeah. And actually, I deserve to be in a padded room. But yeah. for whatever reason, somebody wants to torture me. <laughs> <laughs> you sound pretty sane to me. You sound yeah, pretty sane I am, to me. Unfortunately, you know, I, I'm hoping someday I just snap. <laughs> And the, the listeners, and once again, in the summation, I'm going to go a little deeper into this, but I knew my aunt, aunt, Uncle Russ and Aunt Sydney Ann very well. Like I said, my Aunt Sydney Ann is my, my father's sister. And I had been over to see them many times in New Jersey, um, going down to Seaside Heights. And in fact, I was with them in Atlantic City when Princess Diana died in 1997. I was wow. with my aunt and uncle in Atlantic City when that happened. I remember it like it was yesterday. So I knew them sure. very well. And they live in they lived in Lakehurst, New Jersey. And if you ever look up Fran's brother's name, Joe Masucci, you're probably going to find Russell Shellhammer, and that is my uncle. I did not know that uh, going into this story. In fact, I found out we were introduced through Megan Good at CharlieProject.org. I had no idea that that was going to be the case when I started uh, looking into this particular disappearance. So, um, and I think that's something that you and I, Fran, are going to continue to try to flesh out. And I think my dad wants to help us as well, being that he knew so much oh, about awesome. my uncle Russ, you know, if he that's can awesome. help in any way, because my uncle Russ and my, my dad were very good friends. So we have that. And once again, I will go into that in more detail, uh, not to take up this interview time. I'll do it after in my own talk after this interview, you had mentioned the FBI earlier. I want to get back to this. You had mentioned half hour ago about what the FBI agent said this said something to you about letting letting sleeping dogs lie when yes. did that happen and what did that mean please tell the listeners uh, about that happened in 1990 uh, and he threw a business card on the on my uh, floor as he was leaving me um, in the beginning when I first met him he was very suspicious of me he was I made him coffee and I went out and got buns at at the, you know, the bakery. And uh, 
he wouldn't eat anything and he was smelling the coffee and he was saying to me, it smells like almonds. And I was like, almonds? Like, you know, so he said to me, you drink it first. So I drank it. I was like, there's nothing wrong with this coffee. It doesn't smell like almonds. I didn't realize that he thought maybe I poisoned it. <laughs> it was crazy. Anyway, he really was dis- very distrusting in the beginning. And then when he got to know me, as he was leaving, he gave me a really big hug and a kiss. And he said to me, honey, maybe you should just let a sleeping dog lie. And he threw the card on the floor and it had this woman's name, Joanne Knight, on it. And I, I didn't know what that meant. So I said goodbye to him. And thank you for all your time. And so long, right? Well, it comes to find out that uh, when I moved to Florida, I had got in touch of one of a dear friend of ours who used to take pictures of me. He was a photographer at the time when I was a kid. And I wanted to see all the people uh, that I hadn't seen since my childhood. And he was one of them. And his name was Richard Lyman. And I got in touch with him and I said, Dick, how are you? And he said, oh, my God, Francis, I can't believe you're on the phone with me. And, you know, he said, did they ever find your dad? And I said, no. And he said to me, I, uh, I said, how's Jan? And he said, Jan left me. And um, I said, oh, my God. So I told him the story about the FBI guy. And I said, you know, he t- told me this crazy name, Joanne Knight. I don't know her. And he said, what? He said, that is Jan's real name. Joanne Knight was Jan's real name. Oh he said, we only called her Jan. And I said, what, are you kidding me? So he said, no. So I assumed maybe that my father was taking off with this woman or had something to do with this. However, uh, a very good friend of my father's uh, in Jersey, Joseph Corey, Joe told me that um, when my father disappeared, that this woman called and asked to speak to my brother. And my brother did speak to her. And she wanted to know if he left her anything. So that didn't make sense either. So if my father was cheating on my mother with this woman, why would she call up and ask if she was left anything if she took off with him? Yeah, of course. That doesn't make sense either. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. But my brother never told us. If it wasn't for Joe, I wouldn't have found that information out at all. My brother to this day never told me that. Hmm. And since 1990, when, I mean, do you think that that's what this FBI agent was trying to tell you? That, you know, your father was cheating on your mother and maybe that could be a, a reason for your father's disappearance now that you look back at it now and when you found out who this woman was? Is, is that what you think the FBI agent was trying to tell you? Yeah, I guess he was. But, you know, again, he wasn't giving me much information. He was asking me more than mm-hmm. he was telling me. Yeah, that's what the whole interview thing was about. Yeah. Because I was uh, curious and I wanted to know if they were investigating and they, they weren't. Hmm. He said that, you know, he, he knew what he knew and that was it. So he was trying to tell me something. So yeah. that's all I got out of that. I mean, I have tried to find Joanne Knight uh, every which way but up. And can't find anybody. I mean, that's a very common name. Yeah. So I haven't been able to find her. And I'm sure by now she's got to be 80 or 90 years old. Is this uh, Richard Lehman, is he dead now? Did he, did he die? I don't, I don't know, to tell you the truth. I know that he remarried. And to tell you the truth, I didn't want to bother the man again. Okay. I mean, I, I don't want to tell him. God forbid. Suppose it is true. I, I don't want to tell him that. Right. Well... I understand that, but on the other hand, it, it may be one more little piece of uh, information uh, of you know what happened to your father. We just don't know. Um, how old would he have been? How old would Richard Lehman have been uh, in comparison to your father's age? Of course, he was in his 60s when he disappeared. Yeah, I, I guess they were about 25 years younger than my father. All right. So there's a chance. There's a chance that Richard Lehman could still be alive and... Um, you know, Jan or Joanne uh, could be alive as well, and I think that's uh, something I'm probably going to have to look into uh, a little bit. You know, maybe I can help you out with that. So this FBI agent um, gives you that card, let sleeping dogs lie, this Joanne Knight, who is a person that 
all these years later, we still not we're still not sure what happened to her, or where she went, or anything like that. No, no. And was Richard Lehman a guy that your father knew at the time of your father's disappearance? I guess he did. They were yes, of course. Yeah, they knew each other yeah. and saw each other often. Okay. Now you had mentioned that Joe, of course, was an auxiliary police uh, officer for Kearney, New Jersey. And he was Correct. he was friends with the chief there. His last name was Potter. Correct. What happened to Chief Potter at the end of the 1970s? Uh, I believe he was suspended off the uh, police department for uh, uh, gambling uh, or some type of illegal activities that he was performing. And um, yeah. that was the end of that. I guess he lost his pension. I really don't know because I didn't talk to him after that. Um, I really wasn't fond of him because of the fact that he never sent anybody to help me when I was hurt. And uh, I, I just, I couldn't have cared less. You know, I, I was shocked to hear it because he didn't seem not like that kind of guy at all. But, you know, hey, you don't know. <laughs> you don't you know just, about anybody. No, you just can never tell. And in fact, he was not the only one in that police department who uh, was indicted and spent some time in jail. There, it was him and some other officers that were involved in this. Is is what they, I is what I discovered. And what I would call the listeners might maybe understand. It's kind of a protection racket. They knew that something uh, was illegal was going on, and I think they were getting a cut of it. They were allowing it to continue while letting it them getting a percentage. I think that that's oh, part that, of what, I think that's I didn't what even was, know that. I think that, that was what was going on. Some sort of protection racket. They were being paid to look the other way. I think that oh, was part of it. Maybe they still are. <laughs> <laughs> maybe they still, yeah, maybe, yeah, it could be. It could be with, with, but with new cops in there now, that's very possible. We don't know. So the police, the, the police chief who was in charge at the time of your father's disappearance ended up being very corrupt. Very corrupt, and not only that, but he was friends with your brother. So, if you suspect that your brother had something to do with your father's disappearance, it could be maybe that's the reason that the cops didn't look into your father's disappearance very, very. Absolutely, yeah. there's so many ways to keep looking at this. Yeah, I, I need some direction. You know, you can go uh, in four directions here. So, you could. I'm trying to after all these years. I still don't know, and I still don't know which direction it goes in. Now, there's one thing that maybe, I don't know if this is a coincidence, uh, we're just not sure, but you had brought it up to me, and in fact, I had never even heard of this, uh, and then you sent me some information, but almost coincid coincidentally or not, almost exactly a year before your father disappeared, and we have to remember at one time you said back in the 1940s your your father was a union boss and you know he had police protection some people wanted to do some nasty things to him he didn't want to allow drugs on the on the waterfront but a union boss in New Jersey disappeared almost in exactly a year before your father did when did you find out about this um was this just recently and what have you learned about it uh, well, we, my cousin Tracy and I are doing our family tree, and what happened was she found an article, and she called me up, and she said to me, do you know that Frank Murray was the local union head of 1247? And I said, no, I don't even know who the hell Frank Murray is. And she said to me, you know, Fran, he disappeared almost a year and a day to, the fa to when your father disappeared. He, he uh, disappeared on September 22nd, 1973, and my father disappeared in 1974 on September 18th. So we found that that was suspicious. I mean, would they hold a grudge that long? I, whoever it was, I don't even know who it would have been. I wasn't even born then. Right. So that was another possibility. Right. And and I even, you know, gave you the kind of theory that it could be that somebody knew about this disappearance from the year before and thought, well, maybe we can do some sort of copycat disappearance. Right. Because I know the listeners, uh, I, you should look it up once again. His name is Frank Murray. 
He was a union boss, last name M-U-R-R-A-Y, if you do a search for his disappearance. What's interesting to me is the facts of his disappearance play out very similar to your father's in that he was his plan was go to meet his daughter and didn't show up, just like your father was planning to go meet his son and didn't show up. Yeah, that's right. Very they're both they were both union bosses, both mean children around the same time of the year. And you I can't help but start thinking, was your father's disappearance some sort of copycat? That'll be something that the listeners are going to have to determine for themselves. But it, it add, does add one more aspect to a very complicated case that's been going on for 44 years now. Not quite 44 years, but a long time. Absolutely. Long time. And uh, I still don't have any closure. And, you know, I'm heartbroken over it. What, what concerns me, too, and I don't know, maybe you won't think that this is odd, but I... I continually search to find out what happened to him. However, my brother never has. Yeah. Well, I, I think what we've learned, listeners probably feel like they know your brother by this time, is that he doesn't seem like the type of guy that, ta- that takes an interest in those things. He's all about himself and seeing how he can steal from other people and you know, grift from other people, be a con man. He and his, I guess, both of his wives, or at least one of them, and, you know, so it doesn't surprise me that he's not interested in your father's disappearance, whether he had something to do with it or not. He seems like doesn't seem to have that kind of personality, um, you know. However, I think that I also told you that I have had some circumstances in some of the cases that I've covered where you have one child who is very, very interested in finding out what happened to a parent and the rest of the kids really don't want to have anything to do with it. And none of those kids are suspects at all. It's just hard to say. It just depends on so many things, what people have going on with their lives, the kind of relationship they had with that parent. Uh, it just depends. Yeah, I guess you know, it does. Yeah, I guess you know, I'm not one of those kids. No, you're not. And you care, and that's the way I would be too if, if one of my parents or both of my parents uh, disappeared. I'd be exactly like you are. Exactly. Oh, my, you know, my mother, I took care of my mother. Right until the uh, time she died, she died in my arms. And my brother at one point had said to me, stop living your life for your mother. Why are you doing this? Why don't you just put her in the nursing home? Because she wasn't she wasn't a, yeah. an invalid. She was just sick. She had a heart condition. So I would spend all my time with her in the emergency rooms. I was always in an ICU unit. As a matter of fact, afterwards, when she passed away, I studied to be a physician. So... You know, it, it's um, it's odd how one child loves the parents so much and the other child could care less. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't yeah. see how that's possible. He just, uh, you get the idea that he just sees, uh, he saw your mother as expendable to something yeah. that could be put to the side. And in what year did your uh, mother disappear? How how long did she live after your father disappeared? Oh, she she lived quite a bit. I mean, I took care of her for a long time. She needed a pacemaker after uh, this incident. She went back into the hospital. Uh, She had mitral valve surgery again in 72. He had the same doctor operate on her in Mount Sinai in New York. And then um, the following year or so, he disappeared. So then she needed the pacemaker. And then she became my responsibility because, you know, uh, my dad took care of everything. So I had to take care of everything because my brother wasn't stepping up to the plate. He he abandoned me. So I took care of her. And then uh, when he took the equity out of the houses, she had to live with me because she, she he kicked her out of her own house. And I, I went through great lengths to secure her financially so she wouldn't have to worry for the rest of her life. And here we are. I didn't know that you shouldn't pay for a house in cash. I, I thought that that was the thing to do. And here I am paying for everything in cash. I mean, I worked like a dog for all that money. Uh, this wasn't something that was handed to me. And, uh, you know, sometimes I worked three jobs, whatever it took. Mm-hmm. So it, it was uh, devastating to me that here I am. I worked all my life and I lost all my money. She lost all her money. And, and we were bamboozled by somebody who's supposed to love you and take care of you. At any point... 
did your mother say she suspected that your her son, your brother, had something to do with your father's disappearance? Did she ever say that? Uh, we discussed it. We discussed it, and she didn't think he was incapable of doing it. She mm. she never said that he was incapable of doing it. Okay. She, my mother's heartbroken. Yeah, of course, of course. And uh, you know, what did she have to say about the things that happened in the early '90s with the identity theft? I mean, that had to be. She wound up in the hospital. She was in the hospital for months. I, I couldn't get her out of there. I had to pay yeah. uh, round the clock nurses to go and sit with her. I was running out of money. I mean, because she was in there for four months. Uh, she was devastated over this. Just, it was just horrific for both of us. I mean, but at the time I worked in Manhattan, so thank God uh, I could see her anytime I wanted. I'd just uh, zoom up to uh, Mount Sinai Hospital and sit with her. You know, and uh, she would talk to me in the morning, and I, the nurse would call me first thing in the morning before I went to work, and then before I got to work, I would go to the hospital to see her before I went. Then I'd go back up for lunch, then to dinner. And then I would, you know, wait till the next morning. But she always had a nurse with her sitting there um, by her side because she was very, very fragile. And she had lost her voice. Her heart was so enlarged that it pressed against her vocal cords and paralyzed them. So she could only speak at a whisper. So she was very sick. And um, I wasn't going to, you know, I wasn't going to leave her side. That's for sure. She was my best friend. Yeah. What became of your Uncle Carmine after your father disappeared? How did he live his life after then? Well, according to everybody, um, I guess he got sick. When all this went down with my brother, uh, I decided to rent out all the properties that we did have because I had extravagant bills with attorneys. And we moved to Florida to get away from all this nonsense and try to clear my head and, and get my mother out of danger. Plus, the weather was better for her. So we didn't keep in contact with the family after that at all. I cut everybody off because I didn't want my brother or my sister-in-law to know where we were. I didn't have any contact with my niece. She never made contact with me, uh, nor did she care to. Um, I guess, you know, she, she approves that her mother's a criminal along with her father. I don't know, but she's an attorney. Uh, so we just cut the family off, and, and I went to Florida, and my mother died in Florida uh, mm. in my arms uh, three days before my wedding. I, mm. I had gotten me married. So it was another horrific um, experience. I had to get married and then bury my mother. Mm. So, yeah, my mother did want to come to the funeral. Uh, he actually called. Uh, I didn't know how he got my phone number. My cousin George gave it to him. And uh, Your Uncle Carmine? Bulls. No, no, my, oh. my uh, cousin, my cousin George. Oh, cousin George. My cousin okay. George uh, was um, a police officer in uh, Florida, and uh, he used to qualify all the shooters around the country. Um, and he was in, uh, in Florida, and uh, he called him, and he told him that, you know, he, my, my mother had passed away, because George was going to give me away at the wedding. So Joe called me, and he said, uh, Francis. And I was like, yes, who is this? And he said, this is Joseph, you know. And I was like, oh, how did you get my number? Why are you calling me? And he said, uh, I'm coming to the funeral. I said, you're coming to the funeral? I don't think you're coming to the funeral. And I'll tell you why you're not coming to the funeral. Mommy left specific orders that you couldn't see her when she was alive and all the things that you have done to her. She doesn't want you at the funeral. So uh, we had some choice words. I had quite a few things to say to him that I never got off my chest. And uh, he did not show up at the funeral. And that was the last time I spoke to him. And that was 1998. And uh, I did have to go to court with my sister-in-law the following week uh, after I buried my mother and got married. And uh, I had to go to Trenton and uh, went to bankruptcy court with them. And in the bankruptcy court, they wrote off all the debt and got away with all the money because they wrote it off. Hmm. Then, then I came to find out 
that the attorney that was representing her in the bankruptcy court was married to the president of one of the banks that gave my sister-in-law the illegal loan. <laughs> Small world. <laughs> How does that happen? Small world. <laughs> exactly. So it's, it's just such a, a tangled web that, you know, your head could spin. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you had told me that, uh, and you can maybe uh, change your mind on this, uh, but when we had talked before, that you had said that after your father disappeared, your Uncle Carmine seemed to live pretty well. The standard oh, of yeah. living, is that your is that your opinion? Are you just, uh, is that just an impression? Or um, what do you think about that? Oh, no. No, no, absolutely not. He always drove a Buick. Suddenly he had a Continental. Uh my aunt had a mink coat and showed up at a wedding. He had just bought a new tuxedo. And, you know, I knew that he was running the business. I knew that he had the business. But how dare he not give my mother anything? Nothing? He left her for dead, for God's sake. And I, I was never really happy after I learned what he said to her. Yeah, I about Sheep's Head Bay. Said that to her. About Sheep's Head Bay. Yeah. That, that never, ever felt like... I just can't even understand why he would say that to her. Did, did he hate her that much that he wanted to hurt her that much? What did she ever do to him? It, it just doesn't make sense. My mother was the sweetest person, on the, and not because she was my mother. You could ask anybody that met my mother. She was a doll. People loved my mother. She had a lot of friends. She was happy all the time. And even through all of this, I never saw her cry. They said that she used to go into Queen of Peace Church and cry like a baby and that it would echo all over the church. And yet, never cried in front of me because I'd fall apart. I'd still fall apart. You know, people like us don't know if our loved ones were tortured before they died or what actually happened to them. And we go through such torture. It's more torturous for us than I think than for the victims. I mean, at least they're at peace. We're still here suffering. Yeah, not knowing what happened. It's horrible. I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. Where can the listeners find out more about your father, what you've been doing? Uh, in fact, uh, maybe we should touch upon this for a second. You have some plans regarding New Jersey and what you think needs to be done, you know, law, as far as the law and some other things. Why don't we talk very shortly about that? Well, I, I would like to actually um, start uh, a foundation. I'm in the midst of trying to get that together. Uh, for cold case society uh, or for cold case families, uh, I want to get a federal law passed for all of the counties to have an investigation center, maybe some type of extension from the sheriff's department, not necessarily where it happened, because these, these cops are too busy. Uh, they don't care. Uh, they, they're cold. I mean, they don't have any sympathy when you talk to them. Uh, they brush it off to the next person. It's just a case to them. Um, I would like to pass some type of federal law that says that we uh, could help each other, maybe. Um, if we all had a place to go to where people could volunteer, such as the, uh, the battered women shelters have, in every county courthouse there's some type of battered women office that you can go to uh, that the people actually uh, volunteer there and, and they help each other. And that's what I think we need to do because we should be undivided in this. So I've uh, created a um, a website I'm working on right now. It's called the Undivided Families for Missing Unsolved Cases. Uh, I do have a um, email address. It's called the USFMC at AOL dot com. If anybody wants to join me in my crusade. And okay. um, I'm on a mission. I will be speaking at missing person events, uh, and I am on a mission to change the way people think about this because it can't go on like this anymore. It, it's, I agree. Uh, it's heartbreaking to these families. 
I agree. You're exactly right, Fran. And, and, uh, and what you do for everyone, I can't thank you enough. I mean, you don't get paid for this. It's, well, I'm not paying you. Nope. Uh, you did this. This is totally a, a giving thing that you're helping everyone. So I want to thank you on behalf of all the families that you help because you're very courageous. So she, you're getting work done. You've mentioned the website. Uh, your father's on, of course, Charlie Project, on NamUs, um, several places. But this is a perfect example, I think, what the listeners are finding out. If you go to NamUs or charlieproject.org, you know, there's not a very long write-up at either of those places. And this just shows you that, and that's no offense to Megan or anybody else, but it's just, uh, just not a lot of information out there. But this should be a prime example to the listeners that in every one of these missing persons cases, even if it's only a, a, a paragraph description, there is usually all of this other information underneath the surface, you know, that is out there. And that's the reason I do the program the way I do it, because we've heard all of these facts today, information about the disappearance of, of your father that I don't think exists anywhere on the Internet right now. But now it's going to no. be out there. People are going to know. Maybe somebody will know something. Well, it's like they erased him somehow, and I have a picture of him that I speak to, and I said, Daddy, I swear I will not let you be erased. This is not going to happen. You walked on this earth. He was very good to people. He was a wonderful father to me. He was a good provider to my mother. I mean, he took care of her mon you know, um, monetarily, and, and he, he loved us, and I'm not going to let him slide. That's not going to happen. Something happened to him. Somebody knows something. It's got to yes. come out eventually. Yes, and I hope uh, maybe tracking down some of these people, like we mentioned, Joanne uh, Knight, or you know, you never know what piece of the puzzle is going to uh, unlock this puzzle. Well, I'm hoping. I pray for it all the time. Yeah, Fran, I want to uh, I want to deeply thank you for joining me on this episode of Unfound. Thank you so very much for taking this program with me. And um, keep in touch, please. Oh, we're going to keep in touch. There's no doubt about it. And you're welcome. Thanks. Have a great day. You too. And that was my interview with Fran Masucci, daughter of Nicholas Masucci. I thank her for joining me and all of you on this episode. And I need to thank Megan Good from charlieproject.org for making the interview possible. From the first time I talked to Fran, I knew she was a very determined, focused, and clear-thinking advocate for her father, even though she was only 15 at the time of her father's disappearance. I will continue to work with her in whatever capacity she wants. Of course, I think it's very clear as to what she thinks happened in her father's disappearance, but she also strikes me as a woman who is open to anything at this point. As for her brother Joe, his behavior if it's to be believed, is one of the most suspicious I've heard of since starting Unfound. He seems like he was a bad guy before his father disappeared, but frankly, that doesn't mean he had anything to do with it. There are many bad people who never have anyone go missing in their family. So, I'm not sure what to make of it. And really, what I think I know about Joe now, I think he would have found a way to rip off his sister and mother whether his father was around or not although Joe would have had to have dealt with his father's wrath. But grifters and thieves are going to grift and thieve, despite the consequences. And then there's Nicholas and his business dealings. He is mentioned in the same FBI files where they documented following Santo Traficante and others who were well-known mafia members. What connection did Nicholas have to them? Did he have to kick up something from his businesses to them? Was he more involved in that? Was that what caused his disappearance? I have no idea if we'll ever know more about that than we do now. But Nicholas's disappearance does play out like what happened to Jimmy Hoffa or Frank Murray who disappeared the year before Nicholas did. And of course, I can't help but think of The Sopranos when I think about all of this. But getting back to reality, this is where I talk about the close-to-home aspect of this case. There's the one aspect that Nicholas's own son Joe might have caused him to disappear, a suspect who is very close to home. Then there's a part of this story regarding my uncle Russ Shellhammer, which we shortly spoke of during the interview. 
I knew my Uncle Russ pretty well. While I was living in Pennsylvania, I probably saw him and my aunt at least once a year. I went fishing in Canada with him, my dad, and my best friend the day after I graduated high school. That would have been 1989, and I'm sure this is during the time that he knew Joe Masucci. And in 1992, they ran for office together in New Jersey to stop government corruption or something, if you can believe it. And I knew my Uncle Russ as a good, solid guy, although he could sometimes get caught up in things. An example... Although he didn't spend any time in jail, he was convicted of simple assault against another driver who was honking at him as they were going into their gated community in Lakehurst, New Jersey. That must have been like 1994, 1995, something like that. My dad, who is still alive, and my uncle Russ were very close. Of course, Russ was married to my dad's sister, Sydney Ann. And when I told my dad about Russ knowing Joe Masucci and Joe's possible involvement in his father's disappearance, I would say that my dad wasn't too surprised Russ would be friends with a shady guy like that. My dad admitted that Russ used to go to a New Jersey prison to visit one of his friends who was there, I think for being connected to the mob in some way, and that Russ did like hanging out with guys who liked to throw their weight around, hence the political involvement. That was absolute news to me. I have no idea whether my Uncle Russ knew Joe's father disappeared, and I'd like to think that if Russ thought Joe had something to do with it, he would have gone to the police. I have no idea if Russ continued to be friends with Joe after their 1992 political campaign. There are so many questions I would ask him if he were alive. I actually believe he could help this case. The way I think of him, I think he would have been totally up for wearing a wire and taping his conversations with Joe but he died in 2004 from a lung disease. Uncle Russ, rest in peace. With that, I'll leave the rest of the theorizing up to you. And that's the program. If you found it informative, please go to the app that you use to listen to Unfound and give this podcast a five-star review. I thank you for listening. I'm Ed Denzel, and you've been listening to Unfound.